morning. Thank you for being here this morning. Um, dear students and families, good morning. My name is Raymond Lu Ming O, oh, and I'm the Vice President of Student Affairs at American University. I have the distinct pleasure to welcome you this morning, and before our President's Formal Program begins, I would love to acknowledge some colleagues who are here who have made this possible. First, I would like to acknowledge Karen Casella, Director of New Student and Family Programs, and Dang Hutchinson, AVP for Student Engagement and Success. <laughs> Karen, wave. Yes, Karen is a celebrity among us, as all of you know through the webinars. Karen, thank you so much for making this possible, and we're so glad to see all of you. I also want to acknowledge all of the students, faculty, and staff who have volunteered this weekend and throughout the weekend, and especially the concert last night as well. Thank you so much, everybody. Now, like many of you, this is my first family weekend, having started at AU a few short months ago. I hope that you're enjoying your weekend so far and that you've been able to have one-on-one -on -one interactions with many of us, students, faculty, and staff, who are here for you to make sure you feel at home. While I feel privileged to be able to address you in this more formal setting this morning, it's the informal moments that I remember and the intimate interactions I've had with many of you that I would like to just share some of those interactions with you. Don't worry, no names. Yesterday, while walking through the ever-confusing Mary Gordon Center and connecting buildings, I shared a laugh with several families who were happily lost, like me, only three months in, uh, but happy as we made our way through the complex maze of corridors and smiling faces to the family mix and mingle, where we gorged on delicious foods and enjoyed the jazzy music in a relaxed atmosphere. There, I spoke with a mom who was excited and anxious about her daughter, who plans on going abroad to Japan, followed by a dad from another family who said, and I quote, I don't particularly like these gatherings. And my wife says, I need to be a little bit more social. <laughs> so anyway, I'm here. A lovely but awkward pause ensued. Then he said, I'm leaving now. <laughs> my daughter's having a good time. So, after that exchange, I made my way to the buffet table only to be stopped by a parent who flagged me down as if I were Taylor Swift at a football game. Oh my goodness, you are that guy on the webinar earlier this week. She then showered me with terrific compliments, making me feel like a total celebrity who had been recognized in public behind my dark sunglasses. It was a blast. The only thing that would have made me feel even better is if she had said, you're even better looking in person. <laughs> I then made my way to the farm to table event to join several families over dinner, and Mike Scher, our director of auxiliary services, it was a fantastic dinner. <laughs> of all the folks to sit next to, I had the privilege of sitting with a former vice president of student affairs from a college on the West Coast. And guess what we talked about, the whole meal easy topics, share governance and change management in higher education. Boring everyone at the table, but we were having a blast because we could talk shop. I also got to know two other first year students at our table. One cheered that he was excited to be able to join his home marching band from the West Coast in the upcoming Macy's Parade over Thanksgiving. Isn't that awesome? Um, the other student was part of a family of double and triple eagles. What a proud family legacy. <laughs> After that lovely, scrumptious dinner, I walked across the street to Bender Arena, eager to enjoy the Flo Rida concert, and over her one parent saying to another, I think mine is doing just fine. She's clearly found a circle of friends since she won't tell us where she's going after the concert, nor will she let us know when she's getting back into the residence hall. The other parent laughed and gleefully, gleefully said, well, I annoyed mine by inviting him and his roommate for breakfast at 8 a.m. tomorrow. 
I couldn't resist by inserting myself to say, sir, your student was annoyed because students don't have breakfast at 8 a.m. on Saturday mornings. I recommend a nice brunch at 2 p.m. <laughs> In short, it has been such a pleasure, and the weekend is not over yet. Please connect with us as we relish these moments to be with one another. We hope that you will enjoy seeing your students, get to know other families, and help preserve and strengthen the supportive Eagles Network as we face good and challenging times ahead. Now, before I turn it over to our esteemed president, I would also like to acknowledge the fantastic President's Council that is sitting right there. And in the spirit of inclusive excellence, I will now acknowledge everyone. <laughs> yes, everyone who is here. So please wave um, to their audience as I call out your name and titles, okay? Uh, Linda Alduri, Dean, College of Arts and Sciences, sitting in the front here. Sarah Baldessaro, Chief of Staff, Interim Vice President, Inclusive Excellence. Matt Bennett, who can write a press release in 30 seconds, Vice President and Chief Communications Officer. Wendy Bolin, my buddy, Dean of Graduate and Professional Studies. Diana Burley. Vice Provost for Research and Innovation. <laughs> Ji Hyun Davis, University Librarian. <laughs> Shannon Hader, in the red here, Dean School of International Service. <laughs> Rodney Hubson, Acting Co Dean School of Education. <laughs> Allison Jackdon was Interim Dean School of Public Affairs. <laughs> and Lena Jaswal, Interim Dean School of Communications. David Marchick, Dean, Kogoff School of Business. <laughs> Phil Morris, Assistant Vice President, uh, University Police and Emergency Management. <laughs> Steve Munson, Vice President and Chief Information Officer. <laughs> Preeta Patel, Vice Provost, Academic Administration. <laughs> Courtney Searles, the most energetic uh, <laughs> VP representative here, University of Ensman. Evelyn Thimba, Vice President, Undergraduate and Enrollment Management. Bridget Trockton, Dean of Undergraduate Education and Academic Student Services. Vicki Wilkins, Acting Provost and Chief Academic Officer. And actually, I think I see Corbin Campbell, Acting Co-Dean School of Education. If I missed anyone, please no one raise their hands. Thank you so much. Now I will turn it to our uh, president, Sylvia Burwell. Good morning and thank you, Raymond, and thank you for doing the thank yous. So I will not repeat uh, the thank yous um, to our team, but thanks. I'll do a thanks everybody for, for making this um, event possible and all that we're doing. Um, and thanks for everybody's dedication to this community, because that's something I'm going to speak a little bit about. Before I dive in, I do just want to acknowledge it's been a difficult week, I know, for so many in our community, and just want to make sure that before I begin that there is acknowledgement of what a hard week um, that it has been. And I first actually want to start by thanking you all for being here. Um, I see one or two students, but I see so many parents, and we really do appreciate you and want to welcome you, um, as Raymond just did, to AU's Family Weekend. And whether you're a first timer to this event or uh, and new to our new our Eagle family, or you've been here before, or you're an alum who's back, or you're one of our families with multiple generations of Eagles, like the one that Raymond described, we are incredibly glad that you all are here. And I hope that while you're here, you're going to be able to explore our beautiful campus, even if that might include an umbrella um, for today. And our 84-acre uh, campus, which just celebrated our 20th anniversary as an accredited arboretum and public garden, is really a rare jewel. And it features more than 5,000 trees and 500 different species of plants. And thanks to the innovation and commitment of our facilities and management team, it is a beautiful place for us to live, learn, and for our students to call home. Um, this morning, as you heard, we are joined by leaders, we're joined by faculty, we're joined by staff from across the entire campus. 
And they're all here this morning because they believe, like I do, that our students are the change makers that our world needs. And they are committed to ensuring that the American University, that American University is a place where all students feel supported, challenged, and empowered. And as I was putting together my president's welcome for today, and this is my last one, I think e each of you know in this role, I thought about what it is that you, our AU families, want to hear from me. And I was reflecting on the fact that our two children, Helene and Matthew, are teenagers now. So it's not going to be long until I'm actually sitting in the seats that you all are sit sitting in. And this past week, we went to our daughter's back to school night. She's 16, she's a sophomore. Um, and we were armed with the instructions to say nothing and please do not embarrass her. Um, as a parent, I understand how important it is to really feel like your child is in a place where they're going to be given the tools to thrive, and whether that's physically, mentally, or socially. And you want them on to be set on a path for success. And I know that the trust that you all place in us is an, or, an enormous responsibility. So today, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about where the community is going and what we believe makes us so special which, not to give away the ending uh, of all this, is our community of change makers, our students, our alumni, our incredible faculty, and our dedicated staff. We are committed to building a community and inclusive excellence. This is a journey where we have made progress, but we know that there's a lot more work still to be done. And thanks to the effort of our team and our entire community, our inclusive excellence work has been recognized with two national awards this year. From everything from increasing the diversity of our senior leadership, which is now nearly half people of color and nearly three quarters women, to our efforts to expand the curriculum and lift up different voices. We're also committed to giving our students care and support to thrive in all aspects of their lives. And we do this by focusing on the whole student. Our vision for AU student experience builds on our strengths. We're unique because our faculty and our staff, who not only engage with our students in the classroom, but also mentor and help them in learning and doing outside of the classroom. We are unique because of our sense of action, our sense of passionate service. And we're unique because of our common belief that our students are the change makers that the world needs today, which means we must support, we must challenge, and empower them to be their best selves. This means that when it comes to student thriving, we've made it a campus-wide priority. And thanks to the $500 million Change Can't Wait campaign, we are making the largest investment in student thriving that this university has ever seen with our new $109 million Student Thriving Center part of which you're already going to experience today when you see the grand opening of our bookstore, when you see some of the food changes and other changes we've done. This center is going to be the heart of the campus, and it's going to have three parts. The Allen and Amy Meltzer Center for Athletic Performance, with state-of-the-art competition, practice, and workout facilities serving all of our students, and a student well-being common. That commons will have academic support, mental health support resources, and wellness programs all in one place. And this will come as welcome news to all of our alumni in the audience. We will be renovating the Mary Graydon Center. And yes, that has been planned for 30 years. It is now happening uh, to give our students more space so that they can gather and engage in the way that students today want to do that. We're in the last year of this campaign, and we are $60 million from the finish line. And the fruits of this labor and generosity will bear fruit for generations to come. And of course, we are committed to our mission, advancing knowledge, fostering intellectual curiosity, building community, and empowering lives of purpose, service, and leadership. One of the ways we carry out this mission is through experiential learning. At AU, our students learn by doing, working alongside faculty and other 
experts to be change makers right now, today. In our College of Arts and Sciences, students are co-authors with our biology and chemistry faculty on more than half of their publications. In fact, our Department of Environmental Science faculty recently partnered with several students to publish one of the first research studies about microplastics in the waterways in our region, which will help improve the health of our rivers and creeks in this region. In our School of Communications, eight students were part of the Washington Post Pulitzer Prize winning team that covered the January 6th events in the U.S. Capitol. You heard that right, Pulitzer Prize a pretty nice thing to put on your resume. In our School of International Service, our model UN team was just recognized as the top team in North America for the second year in a row. Yes, that, that is an applause line. These are applause lines. Thank you. In our School of Education, our students are making a difference in our local community right here, right now. They're working with public DC school teachers and helping them, our students in the D.C. public schools progress 25% faster in reading than the national average. And that's impact that's going to resonate for generations. In our School of Public Affairs, ranked number 10 in the U.S. for the second year, our students are interning on the front lines of politics and government and are going to land jobs and have landed jobs in key federal agencies, such as the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or the White House. And we're finding new and creative ways to give our students real world experiences. Last year, we actually launched a first of its kind course that challenges 35 students from across our campus to achieve sustainability gains through investments in environmental, social, and governance ESG funds. Our board of trustees committed a portion of our endowment, 1% of AU's endowment, a total of $10 million to the class, so that the students are now advising our board on how to invest those monies. While we believe this reflects a unique level of commitment, it's part of our campus-wide focus on sustainability, which is an integral part of who we are. Five years ago, we became the first university in the United States to achieve carbon neutrality, and we met that goal two years early. Now, we're working towards zero waste by limiting plastics on campus. Sustainability extends to our learning and our scholarship as well. In the Kogod School of Business, where our motto is building a sustainable world through business, we became one of the first business schools in the nation to offer a Master's of Science in Sustainability, and that was a decade ago. Today, Kogod's sustainability curriculum has been recognized as the best in the country this year. Yes, another applause line. And we're expanding our sustainability management program to meet the growing demands for business leaders and climate and sustainability expertise. Our graduates actually tell the story of who we are better really than anything else. They often talk about how the experiences they had here and the connections that they made launched them on their change-making path. Anidra Edwards, a 2015 AU graduate, was actually recently honored with one of our Ebony Eagles Awards. Anidra is a visual effects editor at Paramount and Marvel, which means that she scrutinizes every shot that glows, goes into a blockbuster movie like things we enjoy and one she worked on recently, Black Panther, Wakanda Forever. Pretty nice job. Anidra says that it was the experiential learning that she had at AU, including a study abroad program at the Film and TV School of the Academy of Performing Arts in the Prague that helped to launch her career. Terry Zublat, AU class of 1995, a little older, was one of President Obama's foreign policy speechwriters. In the spring, he'll actually be returning to his alma mater to teach political speech writing. Growing up, Terry dreamed of coming to Washington and serving in the government. He credits AU with making that dream a reality. Julius Mada Bio. He earned his undergraduate and graduate degrees here at AU. Now he's known as President Bio. He's currently the president of Sierra Leone, 
and he stopped by AU to talk to our students in our community before the United Nations General Assembly to talk about how proud he is to be a member of this Eagle community and what AU meant to him and how far he's gone and what he does now. Our global network of 145,000 alumni are leaders in government, media, public health, education, and more. They're building impact in their communities and pursuing meaningful paths to success. And 90% of our newest alumni are working in graduate school or both within six months of graduation. Among those who are working, 89% hold jobs in the field of their chosen career. Your students will soon become a part of this esteemed and renowned group, following their own paths and forging their own impact. And as well, as you as well as they, will always be a part of this Eagle family. As we like to say here at AU, once an Eagle, always an Eagle. Today and into the future, we know that you and your students are a part of our secret sauce and that there are plenty of challenges ahead, but here at AU, we're made for this moment we're not afraid of challenge, and that's actually when we thrive. As I told our first year students at our opening convocation, you are here because you belong here, and we can't wait to see what you're gonna do. Thank you all for being here today and for being part of this AU family. I hope that everyone gets to enjoy this AU family weekend. And with that, I'll turn things back to you, Raymond. Thank you. Thank you so much, President Burwell. Now for the fun part. We will have a facilitated conversation with President Burwell, and I will be facilitating um, and soliciting questions from the audience. To make the best use of our time in consideration of the number of families present, we recommend focusing questions at a high level so that our conversation will have resonance for many, if not all, here this morning. Don't worry. If you have very specific questions, say, about campus security, housing, advising, food, or a particular situation, such as a roommate concern, involving your student, we have colleagues who can spend more dedicated time with you at tables. And I actually want to acknowledge all of them here on a Saturday morning over here. Great, um, thank you so much. And I see many families and guests um, uh, uh, up there in the terrace area. If you would like to join us down here, no obligation, feel free. There are plenty of uh, empty seats around. Okay, terrific. So now we will begin uh, the question and answer um, uh, segment. Uh, who would like to start? Anyone with, with a question? Oh, over here. Thank you. Thank you, Raymond. Thank you, Sylvia. Is that last time? Um, my name's Suzanne Mohan, and I'm the mother of a senior. I can hardly believe it. <laughs> How these four years have flown by. Um, Chloe's in the School of Public Affairs, and she's had an outstanding experience. So, big shout out to Vicky Wilkins and all the team. And I also want to say, uh, Another big shout out to the Change Can't Wait campaign. It's been fantastic to see that come to fruition, particularly as it's been run through the pandemic years. So lots of great things have happened in the time here. Um, Sylvia, you've talked a lot about change and this is a constant theme in the university. What I wanted to ask you is what you would like to remain the same and not change and what you would tell your successor will be the things that are important to preserve that make an AU experience unique. Thank, Thank you, you uh, so much for the question. And actually, the, the question kind of bookends. The question is, is what do I not want to change? What do I not want to change? You know, we say change can't wait. We're all about change. The world around us is changing. But what are the things we don't want to change um, was the question. Thank you um, very much, Susan. And I would say that um, that question actually brings me to the beginning of my time, to the end of my time. So when I first came to American University, uh, when as soon as I got here, I wanted to get a strategy in place quickly. And there were three questions that I asked over a thousand people, parents, students, faculty, staff, 
alumni, our neighbors. Um, and those three questions were, number one, what differentiates American University? Number two, what's the one thing that has to change to take us to the next level? And number three, what's the one thing that must stay the same in order for us to go to the next level? And in all of those questions, you couldn't get five minutes into the conversation without people saying place of impact, passion, uh, change making, all of these words. It was, I, I think, one of our Fulbrights in London. I think, Courtney, you were with me. Um, and she answered the question and she said, there is no apathy at American University. Just the idea that people come with a desire to make a difference in the world. And now as I'm at the end, and obviously I'm sure you can imagine that the board has asked me what are the things that I think are most necessary in a successor. Uh, and so this question comes up in terms of what are the things that must stay the same. And there are a number of things that I believe need to stay the same. The first is that deep connection to who we are. That's who we are. And that hadn't existed and been articulated. It existed, but it hadn't been articulated in terms of who this university is, in terms of the passion, the deep you know, approach to change, the, you know, the students who on my investiture day chalked uh, about investments in fossil fuels. That's who we are. And that's a part of this institution that should not change because it is defining and it is important. A second thing that I would say should not change is the importance of uh, inclusive excellence as a priority for this institution. And we chose inclusive excellence because inclusive excellence is about creating a space where students at, can thrive uh, in their learning and in their doing, where our faculty can do their research in there in terms of thriving and where our staff can. And the idea of inclusive excellence, that you're not going to be excellent unless you're inclusive, is the second thing that I would say um, we don't want to change. Um, the other thing is the deep engagement that this university has with students uh, in terms of how we think about it. And I spoke to a lot of that. But how our faculty engage with students um, and how our staff engage with students is something. The student at the center is another thing that I would say um, should not change in terms of our university. Thank you for the question. As you can see, I am focused actually on, on this issue. Um, and you know, as part of this, this whole question, I'm staying. Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure if everyone knows that I will be a distinguished lecturer at the Sign Institute uh, of Policy and Policymaking um, starting July 1st. Uh, here at the university and I'm staying because I believe in the place uh, and I believe in these things that I don't believe will change. Thank you so much for the question and thank you President Burwell and speaking of student engagement I see our AUSG and student leaders sitting out front here absolutely it's it's all about you guys another question Can you all wave because our student leaders are here I just want everybody to see thank you all thank you all for getting up and coming this morning thank you and thanks for what you all do in terms of your leadership another question Okay, while we're, oh, we go. Hi, and good morning. Um, my son is a junior and is very lucky to be able to take advantage of some of the experiential learning aspects. He's interning on the Hill this semester. But getting there has been a bit of a challenge. Is there any expectation, I know you're stepping down, there's going to be somebody new coming in, but is there any expectation that at some point there might be an expansion of the shuttle bus process to go beyond just the Tenley Town Metro and go either to the Hill or somewhere in, you know, more mid-city to make it easier for students to access those places rather than have an hour 20 commute each way? I'll start and then Phil, do you want to add? It, it, I'll, I'll start and then see if you um, want to add. Um, the issues of, of transportation for our, our students, you know, we are very fortunate to have the advantages of the experiential learning that we were talking about um, in this uh, city that does so many different things, but at the same time have what is a traditional campus. Um, and that's something that distinguishes us uh, from some of our other, some of the other institutions in this city. Um, as part of that, 
we know this issue of the students' transport. And what we did to, to help with this problem in here and, and maybe afterwards, you know, talking to Phil a little bit more about some of the details, what we did, and we were the original university to do it. Now GW, I think, may have got, have they gotten it, Phil? I'm looking at you. Um, I don't know that they've gotten the deal. We negotiated a deal with the Metro, with the DC Metro and all of the buses and transportation systems where it would be a highly, we would pay uh, and students would be able to get something called an AU pass and be able to transport and go back and forth. And that was a part of our effort to do that. It sounds like there may be some other issues um, that you're experiencing. And Phil, maybe, um, do you want to add anything or do you want to wave and maybe you all can catch up as we get to the end? Phil, do you mind, if you don't want to add anything, if you can just make sure so we know where to, and any other parents who want to talk about the transportation issue, please um, join. Bill, thank you. Excited that your student is doing experiential learning, um, and you can hear that that's something that we want to uh, support as we can. And as a matter of fact, I would tell you that also on this transportation issue, the shuttle was originated um, many years ago in the 1970s, and it was started by um, the person who just left as our board chair. One of our alums, uh, a man named Mark Duber, for anyone who's in Duber Hall, um, Mark, who went, met his wife Nancy here, he also started the shuttle um, service. So it is something we, we know and focus on. Thank you so much for the question. Um, I see a, a very enthusiastic hand uh, up here. Uh, good morning. Um, I am a parent of a incoming student, uh, first year, uh, American University, and she's really excited to be here. She's doing well, so we're happy um, to, to have her here. So my question has to do with undergraduate admissions and um, how the Supreme Court decision impacts American University undergraduate admissions um, and what plans are going forward to address that. Um, thank you and, and thank you for the uh, question about this. It is something that uh, we as a university have focused on. One of the things that I would say, so the, the question was uh, the Supreme Court's decision on race conscious admissions and how that has Amer uh, impacted our undergraduate admissions in American University. And, and Evelyn, I will ask you, I'll start us and then uh, you can add and, and finish um, that. So with regard, the first thing I would say is, um, as I said, inclusive excellence is a really important part. It's one of the things I emphasize that we need to continue. Uh, one of the things that we started, even when the court decision came out, is we, uh, we are not going to talk about or think about that court decision without making sure we're talking and thinking about our inclusive excellence work um, in terms of how we approach this. Uh, and approach this issue. And it's something we have been approaching for a number of years as a, a, a university and what we do. With regard to the question, I think everyone probably knows that it affects the actual admissions process. And it's, we could get into the details of more complexity, but I think it's fair to say, understanding um, and implementing what the part of the decision. We will implement the court's decision uh, about this issue and that affects how you review applications. That's the basics of what has changed here. With regard to everything else, uh, we can continue and will continue on our path uh, in terms of pursuing the kind of diversity that educates um, all of your students, the things that they get exposed to, the experiences, and that is all kinds and types of diversity um, that we do. So we are implementing the decision in that way, we are also focused on ensuring that um, communities know and understand uh, that folks are welcome here. Uh, and so what it has meant for us is that we have more deeply focused on some of our inclusive excellence work uh, as we work through and whether that's how we do our affinity housing and affinity housing events or we also had sessions to educate the community. Uh, before the decision, we actually had people talk about the history uh, of the courts and the decisions about these programs. And then as we did it afterwards, we also did updates. And so the big answer I think is we implement the court's decision in our admissions process and we continue on our path 
uh, of that. And I would invite everyone, is it at one or two, the Multicultural Alumni Reunion? Thank you, Courtney, it's at one. Um, and some of the events and other things that we do to make sure that our communities feel welcome and know that they are important parts. Evelyn, what do you want to add? All right, good morning, everyone. Again, Evelyn Thimba, and I am really pleased to join this team and oversee enrollment. It's harder to hear. All right, so thank you so much for that question. As you can imagine, both on a personal level and a professional level, that Supreme Court decision was a difficult one for, for me, for my family, and of course, for this community. One of the things that really drew me here to AU, of course, is this commitment to inclusive excellence. And even before I arrived on campus, because the Supreme Court decision came out a few weeks before I, I started here, we had a meeting, and the tenor of the meeting just allowed me to really believe in the, um, in the dedication of this community. One of the things that was shared from the president um, and a message shared to the from the Board of Trustees is their continued commitment in the work that we are doing. And so, as Sylvia mentioned, the decision is impacting just one part of the enrollment process, right? So the, the, the way we make decisions um, is going to have to change. However, how we recruit a class and how we yield a class is not impacted by this decision. And because of the commitment that AU has made, I am assured and our team is assured that we will continue to double down on our efforts to make sure that as we are building the funnel, the application funnel, we are, we are visiting in, um, schools, we are targeting communities where we can continue to build a community of diverse students because that is what we really want want here on our campus. So how we are recruiting students is not impacted. Right? How we admit students may be impacted, but how we continue to engage them after they are admitted is also not impacted. So we have a plan in place to make sure that as much as we can, as much as we can control, we continue to keep um, our, our eye on, on our mission and our vision to promote access and opportunity here at AU. Our, 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 our deep, deep understanding that every student's academic experience is enhanced when they have different voices in the classroom. That's our guiding principle. And so th there are some things that are changing, but at the core, um, our vision, our goals, our priorities are not changing. If anything, we are doubling down on those. And we're watching, of course, very, very closely on further decisions that may be coming um, and, and, and getting ready and preparing our community for that. So thank you so much for that question, though. Thank you again for that question. It's something that we've been thinking about a great deal and we've been reflecting on. Thank you so much. Other questions? Oh, I see a hand over here. Good morning. Um, I'm Greg Estrella. My son is a freshman this year, um, all the way from California. And one of the reasons we chose this school is because of uh, we, we thought it was one of the best places to get um, great opportunities for him to proceed to the next step. And um, one of our concerns became, um, in light of the U.S. News and World Report, which we're all aware of, I think, we we're wondering. Uh, are you planning to form a committee, anything that will address some of the concerns that would, you know, hopefully continue to show the school or show the U.S. what, how great of a school this really is? Sorry, I, I apologize, I couldn't hear. The question is about U.S. News and World Report. Um, I think probably everyone in this uh, room can understand, like, when I got a number of a 33% drop in a 33 point drop in one year um, my concern and disappointment my concern and disappointment may not be exactly about what you think it was about I appreciate the question because it's something I have spent lots of time spent lots of time with other presidents um, as well as with our team uh, about it uh, my disappointment actually was had started before and our team has known this that you know, I have never said, you know, some presidents come in and in their strategy they say, 
we're going to move this many points in the U.S. News. And, and the measure, even before this year, I did not believe was the measure that we owe you. We owe you as parents and we owe you as students. What we owe you is delivering on our mission. And delivering on our mission is the quality and the outcomes. To your point, that's why in my remarks, I talked about what we're delivering. You can go on our website, and you've been able to for almost 10 years, go on our website to We Know Success. Because I know that's what students want, and it's what parents want. That's not all they want. But they do want to know and understand uh, who's getting jobs, who's getting jobs in the fields they want, and what's happening in that space. And so uh, we have focused on those things. Do we need to do better? Do we need to do more? Absolutely. But that's where we put our time and attention. And we put our time and attention on the things that get you there. We believe that smaller class sizes actually are important, and that's part of why you send your students here. That was one of the things that was completely eliminated from the rankings. Completely eliminated this year. Doesn't matter anymore. So places and students who go to 500, 100 person, I mean, lectures, and that that's how they're getting their college education, there's no differentiation in terms of what they're measuring. And so the issue of the, the rankings in this drop, the other thing is the measures don't measure what they say they measure. And, you know, in what I felt was appropriate, got my provost, got Evelyn, uh, enrollment and admissions, and we got on the phone with them because I could not recreate this data. Couldn't do it. Couldn't do it in terms of, like, help me understand. We, in a year, we've changed, like, what? And so we got on the phone and talked to them and talked to them about the measures. And, you know, what came from the conversation was basically a, a sense from them that it, it doesn't matter if it's not measuring accurately what is portrayed. So we're in a bit of, I have to be honest and say, as a university, I'm being honest and transparent, it's a bit of a box. Because I always like to say, you can't beat something with nothing. And until there is something that families use that actually measures what you want and what your student wants and needs, you know, we're in a bit of a box. But I will tell you our approach to it. I mean, the idea that we changed that much in one year, like, how can that be? How can that, you know, be true uh, in terms of, of, of what's happening? What we're doing right now is we're doing a couple things. We're focusing deeply on the things that we know that you all care about, and whether that's our retention, our graduation, our social mobility issues. Those are the things that we're measuring, and those are the things that we're going to do a better job of talking about and telling people what you just said, telling people about uh, in terms of doing that. We're going to focus on the substance of what we know is right, and we're going to, in addition to that, communicate in different and other ways. And the other thing I will say is that I'm in conversations with other university presidents about how we think about the creation of the tool. You know, when I, in my old life, I think you all know I'm not a traditional, uh, you know, this is, I have not been in the academy my entire career. And like, I just don't understand, and, and maybe the parent in this room is going to do it. I'm going to say this out loud because I am hopeful that there is a parent in this room who is in technology. This is like a simple consumer issue. And in a day of Amazon Prime, where what you want, when you want, how you want it, how you search it, everything, like that's what you ought to be able to do. You ought to be able to just like go on and figure out, my student wants urban, my student needs science, my student needs X, and, and do that. You ought to be able to do that. There should be a tool. And US News is not that tool. As a matter of fact, I think at times it's a disservice. So I am hopeful. Uh, but while I'm being hopeful, we will continue to work on the things that count and matter. Can I tell you, they change the rankings so much that so many institutions, like, I don't know what they'll use next year. They don't tell you. There's not transparency. Um, so I apologize that I can't guarantee that, you know, I've got a goal and we're going to move. What I can tell you is, is we will move on the things that are most important to you. Thank you for the question. This is a hard one. Uh, and I hope, you know, you appreciate I 
uh, those who have been here, like our, our senior parents, know that is who I am and, and the, the transparency of saying what's hard, what we can do, and what we can't do. Thank you for the question. Thank you so much for the question. Um, I, th I think there was a hand over here, and then I saw a hand over there. So, um, Alex, right? Hi, thank you for this morning event. My husband and I are parents of a first-year student, and I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what you do, and maybe about what we could do to encourage our daughter to really take advantage of all the opportunities at AU. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the question. Um, <laughs> yes, I, I uh, understand and appreciate the question because I do have two children and uh, teenagers and uh, um, I will say, um, last night Matthew refused to come to the Florida concert. Um, so um, get it, uh, appreciate uh, what you're saying. So. I think one of the um, uh, things that you can do, what, what we do is we try and provide the events, and Raymond probably will wanna, I, I should defer to Raymond in terms of what we do. I'll defer to you for that part, um, as, and I will also defer to Raymond on the parent part, but I'll just start by saying, I think it is about the getting, um, the getting it started. The, 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 and we all know this as parents. It's like, I don't want to, you know, it is getting them to those events and figuring out, and sometimes um, creating the space for uh, the choice, you know, instead of, you really need to do this, like, you know, having them get through the logic of how to get there in terms of what this can and will do, uh, in terms of your encouragement. And sometimes that's just about creating the access to the information. You know, that's part of why we communicate with you because sometimes students aren't reading what we're sending them, but they may read what you send them. Like, hey, don't know, but you know, there's this. That those kinds of things, I think, are some of the ways that you can be supportive of them, um, is you can be an information conduit, which is a part of why we engage so much and so closely with parents, because we know they're here, we, we got that, but for some of them, their communication with you is still quite uh, consistent in ways that can be helpful to them getting information. Raymond, I'm going to turn to you on both of those pieces. Of course. Raymond um, is the professional. <laughs> um, uh, thank you so much for the question. Um, anyone watch my terrific webinar earlier this week? <laughs> okay, so you probably heard uh, what I said there, and I, and I think some of it is worth uh, repeating. Uh, we always receive this question, and sometimes as parents and family members, we struggle because we know there's a whole rich world out there at AU, and sometimes we wonder, gosh, you know, why are they not, or uh, when, shouldn't they be wanting to um, do, do a bit more? One of the first things that I always say to parents and family members is, you know your student better than anyone else. Trust your gut on that. Second, you also know your student as to what might be um, the most motivational in inspiring ways. So you may know that if you were to say, so according to Karen Casella, there are 18 events this weekend. Um, I think you should go to. That might not work for, for your student. What I often recommend is what I call the power of the open question. I'm a clinical counselor by training, so I love that. Um, so um, ask questions other than yes or no questions. For instance, something that you could do is to ask your student, how's it going and what are you planning to do this weekend? And stop talking. Listen, I think often our students want to be heard and, and through those conversations, you strengthen that relationship and then you can also pepper it with the resources that you are aware of. Second, um, that I will also say is, to Sylvia's point, really build on that connection you do have with your student. You can tell them that I said this and that I did this. In the beginning of the year, it was my first time I had to have some fun too. My mom and, and dad are in Taiwan, so I said to both of them, well, you know, I wanna make sure students remember that this is a very important time, but they also have family members. So I actually took time during the Eagle launch to do a quick selfie 
And I said to them, remember, keep connected with your family members. Use that and build on that. And sometimes simply reinforcing that will provide the opportunity to do new things. Final thing that I'll say is something that I often say to not only students, but also colleagues. Part of being at AU is to get out of your comfort zone. Not everything is going to feel convenient. Not everything is going to feel comfortable. That's actually good because we want you to grow and we want your student to grow. So allow those concepts um, to guide you in the conversations and just remember to focus on the connection with your student um, and ask open-ended questions. I truly find that to be helpful for parents. And I've had parents say to me, my goodness, that sounds like such a simple advice and it actually works. I just stop talking and, you know, and, and, you know, build more trust. And then they also take my advice. So that's actually what I would encourage you to do. So welcome. Other questions? It looks like there's one up here. Yes, thank you. Um, we are parents of a first year uh, from South Carolina, and in our decision-making process, one of the most important things to us is the leadership of the institution, because we firmly believe that everything rises and falls on leadership. And as an outgoing president, uh, I'm interested to hear, uh, what can you share about the process to identify your successor, and also how to how do we um, address some of the, the interim and acting roles that you have in senior leadership to make those permanent? Because for us, culture and, and inclusive excellence starts with leadership. And uh, what can you share about that process? Thank you. Absolutely. Happy um, to talk about that process. And that is part of why the announcement came when the announcement came, so that there is uh, a steady process. In institutions, it's my experience that there are always transitions. There's transitions at the top, there are transitions at the next level, there are transitions throughout the organization. But what's most important is a, uh, first of all, quality, because quality begets quality. That's my experience. When I used to get frustrated, I can still remember one of my bosses, I would be frustrated because like, I've had times where, you know, seven of my direct reports have been picked off because, and like, the person above me just said, learn this right now. Quality begets quality. Good people get replaced by good people. And if you have good people, people want them. Uh, that you're always going to have that. But the good news is, is when you have quality, you're gonna be okay, as long as you handle transitions well. With regard to my transition, the board has announced uh, a process and has announced a committee and is already working with a firm, uh, Russell Reynolds, to find my replacement. And they are doing all the right things in terms of getting input from the community on what are the most important qualities that are needed uh, in my successor. Uh, they have consulted with me about that and are going through quite rigorous process uh, to pick my successor. With regard to my role in this, my role in this is making sure at, that this is a place where my colleagues, either from non-traditional or traditional approaches, want to come and be here. And that is incredibly important to me and what I work on every single day. What my hope is, is that the person who replaces me, they are gonna take this university further and faster to the next level than I did. That is my hope, and that is what I will build for. This incredible leadership team you see here, uh, folks from the outside, a person from the outside who's very familiar with higher ed, was at our board meeting, heard from this team, and said, you need to understand what a jewel you have. I go to board meetings, and your C-suite, your senior team, is one of the best I have seen in this nation. And so this is why I'm confident. The campaign, I mentioned the campaign. Our campaign is $60 million from the end. You all should know, when we did the consultation, we were told to do a $450 million campaign. That was a stretch goal, and it would take an extra year. I'm sure you're not surprised. I said, that's nice. We're going 500, and we're going to finish on time. That money, those resources are going to flow to my successor. The changes that we've made, inclusive excellence to the important question about the SCOTUS decision, we're not going back. It's in the fabric at this university. And so all of that is why 
I can't say what the board is going to do, but I am very close to my board. Of all my president colleagues, I, you know, the relationship I have with my board, I feel blessed and grateful. So I do feel pretty confident about what I'm saying. This place is going to be in great hands, and we're going to have a great leader, and we have a great leadership team um, as we go forward. With regard to some of the transitions and that sort of thing, um, you know, that is a natural part of the flow. It's also a natural part. One of those you hear because uh, we have afforded one of our deans the opportunity to be on sabbatical. Uh, and that was a part, you know, you know, keeping high quality people, making sure you do all the things and that sort of thing. So with regard to that, I'm not uh, concerned about that. Um, you know, we need to do it. We're in the process on uh, these searches. And the other thing is there are certain decisions that I'll be honest and say we talk through as an institution and that my successor should make. Uh, in terms of that. So I hope that's a transparent way to get to um, your, the different parts of your question. Thank you for asking it because I think it's important for all of you all to hear. Uh, and you know, I'm staying because I'm confident in the place. Thank you. Thank you so much for the question. And um, we only have a few more minutes, so maybe a quick question. I see um, the woman in the red over here. Thank you. I appreciated President Burwell at the beginning of your remarks that you acknowledged that it's been a difficult week. And last night, um, I'm the mother of a senior and the daughter of an alum from the class of 1936. So AU has been in our family lexicon from my, the beginning of my life. But um, our daughter shared with us last night that a friend of theirs had shared with them that they believe the circumstances of this past week could tear the university apart. So first, I just wanted you to be aware, you probably already are, that that is a sentiment out there, and also to ask how you uh, plan to address that possibility. So um, the efforts of, um, and what has happened this week, um, you know, at the root of your question is actually what my role and responsibility is. And the safety, the support, and the creation of a learning environment are the most important things. And that is what my role, you know, and I need to focus on uh, every day. With regard to the specific of this, we are deeply focused on the safety and security. So you all know, we are the most fortunate university. I, you know, I actually don't talk to a president anywhere in the country, and even here in DC anywhere, who is lucky as we are, because Phil, who is quite modest, who raised his hand, Phil used to run the Capitol Police. Uh, so Phil's professional experience and relationships in this community, right now the Department of Homeland Security has the most detailed plan of any university. They know every building, they know every room in every building in this university. We take the issues of safety and security very, very seriously. That doesn't mean, you know, we all know, but we take these very seriously. All of our events this weekend are staffed to a greater level than they, has, than they would have been, and there are a number of other steps that we're taking to promote that safety. In addition, Part of that safety and part of that security and part of that support are the events that we're trying to do to support the community. And those are happening throughout because that's an important part of what is happening right now. There are many people in pain, many people. And making sure that we're providing the places for support for that pain and also places where people can express themselves in appropriate ways that don't lead to the kinds of things that people are concerned about and talking about. I would just bring the rest of my answer back to the Supreme Court question, actually. And that's because our work on inclusive excellence, on creating an inclusive community, the work that we have done over these years together has to be the base of keeping our community together, creating a place of respect and trust 
and support. And what that means to each individual is actually different, and we know that. And what we work to do is try to meet different groups of people where they are at this time, which, as I began with, is a difficult time. Thank you for the question. Um, I think it also, I appreciate the question because it gave me an opportunity to talk about what is the role of a president in the university uh, in a way that I hope is constructive and helpful to all of you as you all read what is happening across the nation uh, in terms of these issues and how these issues are uh, really sort of at a uh, critical point on campuses um, where there are many young people and there are expectations about points of view being expressed. So with that, thank you. And are we, we are, yes, is that a wrap, Raymond? Absolutely, um, and that's actually a terrific point to wrap. All the more reason that we must focus on community and you are part of that extended community. It is such a pleasure to have an intimate conversation with all of you. Thank you, President Burwell, for answering um, our questions. We look forward to seeing you all weekend. And if you need to reach any of us, many of us are doing tabling. And I'm also going to leave some of my cards here on the table uh, should you have additional questions. We're glad that you're here. And we hope you have a terrific weekend. Thank, Thank you. you.